about building personalized and proactive smartphone assistants. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for having me. So I'm very situated in uh, Demotech, which is a local startup. We're not based that far from, from here. And we're building a smart home assistant, something like Google, uh, Google Home or Amazon Alexa. We're just thinking slightly differently about it. And in this talk, I will be speaking in particular about personalization and proactivity. And why actually computer vision is important for these devices and for the next generation of these devices. It's not that much a company talk, it's rather, you know, how I'm thinking about these, these things and, and uh, how I see the potential future of these devices. So, back in 2015, Amazon has unveiled the, the Echo the speaker with uh, Alexa voice control uh, device. And this has been quite significant success. They sold many devices, and pretty much since then, they are starting at hearing many more similar ish speakers. So, Google came with, with uh, Google Home, uh, Amazon in their very own spirit, they extended it into the whole family of, of devices. Uh, Apple came with HomePod, and there are tens of other smart home assistants or smart uh, home robots that are trying to, to do, do these things. Uh, and to be honest, the market is growing pretty crazy. It's, it's like exponentially growing. These are something of uh, sales, something of printed sales. So when you see something like this, I guess most of you are asking when is this going to crash, right? Or you know, when uh, is, is the hype already over or, or what's going to happen? So in this talk, I will try to explain or, or uh, I will try to explain why I think that this is just the very beginning of these devices, that this is like the first generation. And also, I will, because we are a computer vision community, I will try to explain why I think the computer vision is the key center, or you know, why computer vision is the key for the next generation of these devices. <coughs> so, by, by the way, how many of you have uh, Alexa or Google Home at, at home? Right, quite a few. So let's take a look at these devices. So pretty much, uh, they allow you to do some simple interactions, such as, I don't know, you can ask what's the time, what's the weather, and, and so forth. And the uh, device will be able to, to provide you some answers. There are also some more advanced uh, interactions, uh, such as, you know, for party content providers, Spotify for music, and that sort of things. And also, there's the whole world of IoT devices that these smart home speakers should be able to, to control. Uh, now, let's just check out how it works right now. So, if you think about it, at first, there is the device. It's sitting somewhere in the corner of, of the room, and it's pretty much just listening all the time, and it's waiting just for something that is called voice trigger. So, when the user says, uh, hey, Alexa, or, or, or hey, Oli, or something like that, uh, then the device actually starts doing something. So, the way how it works is actually that there is some very small, uh, very lightweight neural network uh, running locally in the device. Say so that you know there is no, there are no privacy issues on these things. And when the user says, hey Alexa or, or, or hey Google, then it will start streaming the data to the cloud where all this uh, speech recognition and then all, all other processing is happening. So when the user asks about the time, the device will stream to the cloud, uh, and then the device will provide <coughs> some different time in one And pretty much that's it. And then actually if you need to, if you want to do some other interaction, you need to repeat the whole process again. So you're going to need to say Alexa, could you tell me something, or Google, could you, could, could you do something else? So, in some sense, uh, there are some limitations. First of all, these interactions are a little bit lacking any personalization, because pretty much every single user is getting more or less the same type of answers. Of course, it's been changing right now, quite, quite heavily. But more importantly, it's just a one way of communication. Every single time, the user has to initiate every single interaction. The device is not able to start interacting with the user upon its own. Uh, and in some sense, this quite limits the, the, the user experience, I'd say. Uh, now, why I'm actually stressing about user experience. So perhaps for this, it might make sense to look a bit more into the bank, into, into the history. So let's think about phones. I guess these days, everyone, when, when you say mobile phone, you will have something like this on your mind. Well, let's go back to 2007. And if you think about iPhone back in 2007, it wasn't the best phone ever in terms of hardware or in terms of text specifications. There were even no application, no, no app store, camera, video recording, things like this. 
and there were much better competitors in terms of the technical specification of these things. In fact, there were even devices that had touch screen and you, know, you could control them in this way. But what I found really, really nailed, that was actually the, the actual user experience. The, the way how you, how you interact with the device was completely different from the other devices and pretty much if you think about it these days, you say mobile phone, this is, this is, this is how it looks like. And I'd say that the current generation of these smart speakers is in some sense much more similar to these to this phones before the, the, before the iPhone era than the, than the current mobile phones. Because that, that user experience is really quite, quite limited. Right, so how can we hopefully in the future try to push it a bit, bit forward? So I'll be speaking a bit about proactivity and personalized experiences. Uh, so when I say personalized, what I mean is that the device should know with whom it is actually interacting. It should know the current user. Uh, because then it's able to provide some, some form of personalized experience. It's able to, to deal exactly with the, this user's email or, or calendar and so on. It should be also able to know user's preferences or, or habits and also some form of emotional interaction. So for instance, someone might prefer much more in introvert each device is someone much more extrovert, different types of uh, complexity of language, things like this. And ideally the device should be learning and adapting over time again and again, pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, when, I mean, when I say proactive, I mean that actually the device shouldn't be just waiting for the user to start all these interactions, but it should be able to start on its own. So, for instance, when it sees the user and, it, it, and the user actually receives an email, it should be able to wake up and say, hey, you received an email from a friend, something like that. And the same can be applied for some daily routines, if you, I don't know, like doing some music, during, having breakfast, stuff like that. So, if you think about it, personalization is in some sense a prerequisite for many proactive interactions, because we need to know the user and his habits. Uh, and to be honest, there are actually different ways how people can be thinking about, about productivity. Uh, some people are be thinking rather adding one extra thing at the very end of the conversation. Uh, I'll be speaking much more about the beginning of interaction, so, so actually when there is no interaction at all and the device actually will, will finish the interaction. Uh, right, so the natural question is actually why is it, how can it be done and whether it's an easy task or it's not an easy task. So in some sense, the device, it, it is very difficult because the device actually has to understand the situation. It really has to, has to understand what's going on. So it has to understand where someone's around. It has to understand where these people are, uh, who it is, uh, whether they are in the kitchen or some living room, uh, which objects are in the, in, in, in the room. So really, really to understand actually what's, what's going on there and what the users are doing and many other things. And this is because the device has to understand whether it is okay to interrupt the users right now. Because if you think about it, majority of the time you wouldn't like to be interrupted by some device, by some, some random suggestion or something like that. And in fact, it's even more difficult because you also need to think about what type of interaction you want to provide. So these are, these are the things that, that are really difficult. And in some sense, understanding when not to interrupt is really, really the key challenge for these practical devices. And in order to be, do that, you need to understand the scene. And that's one of the reasons why computer vision is really a game changer for these type of devices. Or at least I think so. Uh, so now I will try to show you an example of one of these devices. Uh, which should be practically personalized and so on. So we want to begin building this device that we call Audit. Uh, and pretty much this device has uh, some cameras, uh, some speakers, LED, LED lights. Uh, it has 360 degrees microphone array, so it's able to listen from, from all, all, all parts. And actually, it's able to spin around 360 uh, degrees around, around itself, uh, moving the various different ways. Actually, I might have a video here. Thank so you. Can, oh, I've lots of energy and curiosity. Probably won't be able to see it. I will need to replicate the screen later. Uh, but pretty much, it, it's able to move in, in any, any arbitrary way. Uh, when I say it's about proactivity, uh, if, you, if you say proactivity, it more or less means decision making. You need to you need to figure out when, when to interact, how to interact, and this. Uh, 
So I guess you are pretty well aware of recent successes with deep reinforcement learning and similarity approaches. Uh, it pretty much works in a way that you typically may take the direct to the raw data, push it through the, through the neural network, and you direct optimize for decisions without handcrafting some features. Uh, it's a very appealing framework because it optimizes directly the objective corresponding to the ultimate goal, which is the decision making of not handcrafting some, some blocks that you're then just trying to stick some together. Uh, it also works very well in fully observable environments. So if you think about, I don't know, Atari games or, or, or Go and this, you pretty much can observe the whole scene and it's, it's just great. But there are some things that are not that great about it. So first of all, in the real world, in the free world, uh, agents do not see the whole scene. They, they see only some small part. So for instance, if I'm looking right now at you guys, I'm not able to see what's going on behind myself. And I have to somehow build a summary of this scene uh, in my mind. To, 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 to do it. Uh, second thing, Visual World is much more complex than some simple games. So it's again not that to train these models in the real world. So uh, in other words, these agents actually have to build these summaries of the world. And uh, there are multiple ways how you can do it. So some people are trying to push it uh, in an implicit way. Uh, are we much more arguing for explicit intermediate representations or abstractions? So if you think about the world, majority of it, of it actually remains static. So you can deal with it in the standard way through semantic slime. You can recognize things around yourself. And then actually just need to relocalize the camera and you perfectly know what's going on. And then actually on top of that, you just need to, need, need to deal with uh, dynamically moving objects and some sort of change detection. This has quite a few advantages. First of all, it's interpretable. You can really decouple each of these blocks. And also, it's computationally very efficient during the test time. Uh, so let's say we have some auto representation. The question is how it can be used for decision making. So one way how this can be done is to augment the, the, the sensory data uh, by these intermediate representations or abstractions, and then push it through the whatever decision making toolbox you want to use, whether it's reinforcement learning or something else. Let's let's sort of ignore the details. In fact, there has been quite a uh, nice paper. Uh, published on you know, in a slightly different domain for playing, playing uh, Doom games and, and similar things. Uh, but if you check out the results, it actually uh, shows that if you're using these auxiliary data, these, these, these semantic maps, it actually outperforms the, the performance of the baselines quite significantly. Also, actually, it, it improves also more advanced uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, another thing is that actually every extra information that you add into that auxiliary map typically, typically tends, tends to help. Of course, it's pretty far from some human level of performance, but it's a kind of story. So we're taking inspiration from this, and we are quite heavily investing into, the, into building all these auxiliary representations. Uh, you can also actually add multiple modalities. So you do not need to have just, just visual data, you can also add audio data, NLP, context, other things in the, in the same framework. Uh, and actually, when I'm saying that we're building some intermediate representations, it doesn't mean that they have to be handcrafted. They can be trained in an end to end manner, that's, that's not a big deal. And they can take the advantage of processing multiple data. It just actually needs to think a bit about how you're, how you're going to extract these things. So in some sense, you can think about it as having one big computational graph where, you, where you're actually adding some auxiliary tasks or auxiliary loss functions at different, different places. And perhaps the last important advantage that uh, having such common uh, representation, what, what it actually gives you, uh, is that it allows you to actually keep collecting the, the, the user's data. It allows you to, you can project in user's actions on some common representation. And that's very important if you want to do some lifelong learning. Your device is supposed to be improving over time. So you can pretty much start projecting user's actions onto the space. So for instance, I don't know where users tend to stand, or I don't know if it's desktop, PC, things like this. So now we will try to show you two demos if I'll be able to play the videos. Uh, all right, mine is screens up here. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Actually. 
Uh, so in this first demo, you see some daily activities. Uh, so pretty much the device is able to recognize the user is coming. Uh, now it's able to greet him. Uh, because it recognizes him, it does something without it out things, and it will start playing some music. This is one of the things that the user can customize with what he wants, and it's interacting in automated way. Then the other users coming, the device will again recognize him, but it doesn't have any differences, nothing like that. You can just read him, use a good thing. Yeah. So that's one type of interactions. Uh, the other one is, uh, the other example is actually a crafty reminder. So that's uh, what I was saying about the email. So now the user. So the user actually asked the device to to, to learn uh, to, to to tell him if he receives some some important email. And then James, can you send more emails? Yeah, sure. Um, so Rory, if you're still there, if you come back into the room, I can just come back to work or if you can see if Bobby has any new. Pretty much, you know, when, when the device again was able to recognize himself and knew that actually he received an email, he was able to practically tell him that he has the email. So now just to sum it up, uh, I'd say that the current devices are great. I love them. They are working in, if you think about the progress, it's been incredible over the past few years. Uh, but in some sense, they are limited in terms of the, the user experience. They, they typically offer only one-way communication. Uh, proactivity and personalization might be one thing that might actually define the next generation of these devices. And if you want to build these type of devices, uh, scene understanding and computer vision is actually a necessary practice. And the key challenge for, for this is to really, really learn when and how not to interact because otherwise there's not much you can do.